Are you having trouble getting control with diseases or at least the control you think you should be getting? Hi, this is Frank the Pest Geek, and on this edition of the Pest Geek Podcast, we're going to go ahead and discover why most people are having trouble getting control or why others aren't getting control at all. Let's look at this. We have to look at the science. This is purely about science and facts. There are two things in the marketplace, science and facts and marketing. And the problem is that most people are given to marketing and believing what they read versus doing the actual reading about what the product really does. Now, let's take a look at this. What do we need to have a disease in a garden? We need three things, basically. You need the plant to be present. You also need the host, uh, the pathogen that attacks the host, the plant that's present, to be there. And then you need an environmental trigger that causes the disease to become active. But the disease is already there. This happens in two different methods. One of them is what is known as a soil-borne disease, meaning the disease is always in the soil. It is always present. You can't inoculate it and you can't eradicate it. It's always there. It's always going to be there. The way you have to think about this is a disease that when the right triggers happen, it becomes alive, but it's always there. So there is no such thing as anybody who is going to eradicate them. All right, so what do we got to look at? Now we have three things that, that needed for the plant, and there's two things, the soil born and the disease becomes either active or inactive. All right, so now we got to look at understanding what type of control can you get? And there is two things that you need to understand that are technical terms, but they're also legal terms, and that is control and suppression. And you might be thinking to yourself, I don't want to get suppression. I want to get control for my client. The client is thinking, I didn't hire you to suppress it or to bring it down or reduce it. I hired you to control it. And the reality is that in some cases, you will have no choice but to only offer suppression. We're going to discuss what are the things that causes us to not get control. Well, the number one thing is cultural practice. What is cultural practice? It is your mowing, your mowing height, mowing frequency. Is the mowing with a sharp blade does the person doing the mowing understand how to properly treat that machine to prevent it from spreading a disease to other gardens? And then also irrigation. Are you irrigating at the right amount, at the right time of day, and in the right frequency to not cause the disease? See, the wrong mowing, waiting too long, is going to help get disease. Cutting that lawn too short is going to cause it to get a disease because it gets stressed. It makes it more susceptible. And if you don't have a sharp blade and you're shredding the lawn, well, it makes it more susceptible if the disease is present. What we talk about in professional pest control is professional integrated pest management. Without integrated pest management, we can't do our job. Think of it this way. You go to your doctor and you tell, your doctor tells you you've got diabetes. Well, you're eating fast food out you got a sedentary lifestyle, you're not exercising, and you're eating sweets. Doctor says you need to give up the sweets, you need to start exercising, and you need to get on these pills. Without you doing the other two, your diabetes is never going to get under control. Same thing with a pathogen. Same thing with an infection. Without doing the right things, you don't get the control you expect. Here's the worst part. You now hired a company or you sold a contract for a quarterly service. Well, the reality is that you can't control diseases on a quarterly service program, and we're going to find out why with scientific fact of why it can't be done. Number two is most companies that are selling pest control are used to selling insect pest control. Insects are one thing. Lawn spraying for 
you know, mosquito, lawn spraying for fleas, ticks, for ants is one thing. When you get into pest control for lawn and ornamental, you have five disciplines that you need. You need to understand the plant. You need to understand the pathogen. You need to understand the insect that attacks that plant. You understand the nutrition. And then you have to understand the agronomy. What is your soil like? You have to learn five things more than if you're doing just insect control. So if you are, are a customer asking your pest control guy who doesn't have experience in doing lawn and ornamental to get into it, it's not his expertise. Second of all, if you are an expert in lawn and ornamental and you're selling a contract that is 90 days, how are you going to get control in between? And that's the problem, you see. So let's take a look at the science. Okay, so let's look at the science here. This is a 431-page manual that tells every chemical manufacturer what they must produce in order to register any pesticide, any chemical, any product in the U.S. And this is what they go by, and this is what they can claim based upon these standards. So what I want to show you is what it takes to get you the control that you think you need. It says down here, if you look at part B down here at the page, four claims that a product controls or prevents plant disease or nematode pest, the product should generally provide under moderate to severe pest pressure at least 70% control of the pest organism. Now you're saying to yourself, I don't want 70% control. I want 100. I want at least 95, but not 70. Well, the reality is that all the product has to prove to say control or prevents is 70%. So you're going to get 70% at least or more or prevention of pest control with any particular product that claims it controls pests. So when the customer goes to the big box store and looks at a chemical product and it says that it controls 50 pests or it controls 50 diseases, yes, it does. However, how much control they're going to get, that's another matter. Let's look at suppression. Part C. Under certain circumstances, a level of effectiveness less than that which is considered optimum or complete may be claimed and be appropriate. Lesser claims such as aids in control or suppresses may be made if less than 70% control of the plant disease or nematode is obtained. Stop. Because this is not what I signed up for is what you're saying. And I'm telling you that in some cases, that is the best you're going to be able to do. The customer, that is the best you're going to be able to get. There is no way to do it. And it has to be based upon what is on the label. So let's take a look at the label. Let's take a look first at a disease so we understand it. And here we have what is known as brown patch disease. And let's look at what causes brown patch disease. Now, this article is in the University of Florida IFAS Extension, probably one of the best uh, entomology programs in the country. And this is written by Monica Elliott, who I actually know uh, is one of the premier pathologists, and especially when it comes to plant and palm pathology. If you've ever taken the palm course by Monica Elliott, you will be a palm expert because she only gives this course about once a year. It's a two-day course that they give in Broward at the Broward Community College, and she teaches that course, and it is an amazing course. It's two days, by the way. But we're looking at Rhizoctonia solani, Okay. This is the pathogen that causes Rhizoctonia blight or what is known as brown patch, okay? Now, turf grass affected, all warm season turf grasses, all turf grasses that are in the south of the United States are what is known as warm season turf grasses, especially St. Augustine grass 
and soysia grass can be affected. Now, in Florida, especially in Miami-Dade, 95% of all the lawns that are installed are St. Augustine lawn, whether it's palmetto or floritam. There's other species, but those are the two most common. Very few people have soysia, and much less people have lawns like uh, Bermuda or seashore puspalum. Okay, they're almost non-existent. Very few people have it because they're very expensive to maintain. And those are known as turfs. All right. So now, what makes the occurrence? It's very simple. It's right here. The disease is most likely to be observed November through May when temperatures are below 80 degrees. Now, you're in Florida. Think for a minute. You're in Florida. We have three, almost four, USDA zones. In South Florida, we don't get frost in Miami, but you do get it in northern and central Florida. So you have temperature variances. If you're in Texas, you have temperature variances in Texas also that are different than what we have here in Florida. Okay, so now when the temperatures go below 80 degrees, you will start having these fungal problems. But remember, you have to have the pathogen there. And a customer may say, I've, I've lived in this home for 14 years and I've never had this. Well, now you do and now you own it because it's going to be there forever. And every year from now on that this happens, these triggers happen, you will get that disease. Now it's permanent. It is normally not observed in the summer months, right here. Okay, not observed in the summer months. You get other summer diseases, but not this one. We have diseases in all four seasons. Infected, infection is triggered by rainfall. Let's look over here. By rainfall, excessive irrigation, or extended periods of high humidity, resulting in leaves being continuously wet for 48 hours or more. Stop. You're irrigating at night, which you shouldn't be. You're watering your lawn manually at night. You shouldn't be. You're going to have a problem if the temperature drops below 80 degrees and triggers the pathogen. It makes me. If you get rainfall and it rains all night and then you have overcast the entire day where it didn't burn off and everything stayed moist, you're going to have a disease. So, this is the result of what we have things that are out of our control that we can't predict, nor can we plan for. There are no contingency for this. All right. So now you're looking at the disease here and you have what is known as the necrotic ring around the outer side of this disease. Inside, the disease has already taken effect and it has killed the lawn, whatever it's going to kill. It keeps spreading outward this way, and then eventually these touch and you get a big giant patch because they all join together, okay? This is what is known as brown patch. It also similar to large patch disease, okay? Now, here's what happens. You get a misdiagnosis. You think you have chinch bug. Your landscaper says you have chinch bug. Well, these are the signs to know that this turns orangey because the disease is progressing and it's killing it and it's moving outward. If you put an insecticide and you have a disease, you're never going to get control. A misdiagnosis on the disease. You also have to know what the disease looks like to know if it's even on the label of what you're trying to control. So without knowing Rhizectonia salani or salini, you have no idea. All right, so let's take a look at a chemical label. All right, this chemical label is what's registered with the EPA. All right, this is what it looks like when they register this product with the EPA and they submitted the label because of the testing it went through and the EPA approves it for what it is intended to do. There are a couple of things on the label that everyone needs to know, whether you're a homeowner or whether you're a professional. And that is this. It is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with the labeling. This label has 23 pages. Look up here. 23 pages. 
if you have no idea what it says that you have to wear personal protection equipment, that you have to wear gloves, that you have to wear a respirator, that you have to wear a bodysuit in some cases, how do you know you're not violating federal law? That is the problem. You care buying products. People are buying products, whether in the store, over the counter, or even online now, and not knowing that they are violating the law by misapplying it. Well, who's going to know? Well, the question is, what if something happens? The second thing is, if you're a professional and something happens and you violated anything on this label, you can come out on state charges, federal charges, fines, and even imprisonment. That is the fact. And this is why it's so important that people get the training. If you've never gotten training, if you've never taken CEU classes, if you've never sat in an eight-hour course on how to properly apply a pesticide, you could cause damage to yourself or other people. And so what we're looking at is the label, that this is what the label says, and this is why we can't make more applications more often or however we want to because the label says not to. Let's take a look at Rhizoctonia solani, which causes two diseases. It causes, right here, zoysia patch disease and large brown patch disease. It says, and here's what I'm reading over here, apply the disease when it first appears. Okay, let's stop. Let's look at commercial. Let's look at commercial application and a, a homeowner application. If you are running a business and you have 150 clients and you're doing six to 10 clients a day that you're servicing, and you're doing maybe then 50 a week. Okay, so maybe you can do 200 a month. How do you know on 200 clients if they have a disease on their lawn? You can't. That's the reality. The client cannot expect you to know that you have a disease because you're not there. They are there, and the landscaper is there every two weeks, and they are the ones that are responsible for informing you that there is a disease problem on the lawn because what the customer signs up for is a quarterly service program and then expects you not to or expects not to have any diseases on the lawn or any problems because they hired you and it can't be done the science doesn't support the marketing and continue on 14-day intervals. In other words, you have to continue applying it when the disease is present to control it every 14 days. And I know what everybody's thinking. Well, they just wrote that in there because they just want to sell you more chemical. No, because it had to go through testing to prove that that's what it controls. And the legal amount that you're allowed to apply by the EPA is based upon that, which is two to four ounces, let's say of this product per thousand square feet, if it is an ounce product. That's the legal limit. You can't go above it. Now, it also says, hey, rotation and tank mix. So you have to rotate it with other chemicals. You can't use the same one all the time because you'll get resistance. And you have to combine it with a product like Mancoseb in order to get the control for 14 days. You can't use it by itself. When you start talking about buying fungicides and, and having three to four fungicides on a truck, that's easily $1,000 worth of chemical. The customer goes and says, well, why can't you make more applications? I need you to make another application. The reality is it is very costly. And when most people, this is why I said at the beginning, most people do not include it in their contract because it can't be done. So fungal applications are usually at an additional cost per application that is needed to get the control that the customer wants. Let's look at another label. Say, well, granulars are way better. Well, let's take a look at granulars. Rhizoctonia solani with a granular at two to four pounds, let's say, and right up here it says two to four pounds per thousand. 
make one to two applications fall when conditions are favorable for disease development. Every 14 to 28 days. You're going to get up to 28 days now, but that's not guaranteed. It's between 14 and 28 days. Not 14 to 28 days. So we look at another product. We look at a product named Eagle. Okay, so you're rotating between products. Well, Eagle says the same thing. One to two point ounces, 1.2 ounces per 1,000, 14 day intervals. It must be applied with another product like four. Being application conditions are favorable. Now, what is a favorable condition? Meaning you have to make it, okay, when that temperature drops. So you literally have to either put all your clients on a, to prevent the disease on a four day, a 14 day program and charge them every 14 days for the entire winter season to get this control or you're still going to have a ton of outbreaks. That's the reality. Now, in Suffolk County, New York, there's a special label right here that you have to follow this. So there are label restrictions that we have to follow and we can't violate them. Let's look at suppression. Well, I don't want to pay for suppression. I want to pay for control. All right, so take all patch. Let me take this out of here so you can see a 23-page label that you have to memorize as a pest control professional. And let's say you have 20 labels. Can you imagine how much knowledge you have to have in your head to do this job? Let's look at this. Take all patch. Apply mid-July when the disease symptoms first appear and repeat 14-day intervals for suppression. You can't control take all patch. It's less than 70%. Remember I told you? It tells you right there nobody is deceiving anybody. The manufacturer is not deceiving anybody. The problem is you don't have the knowledge because you have to read the label and you have to know and take a course to understand what it is that you're doing. And so many landscapers are out there applying pest control for their clients, doing applications of fungicide because they can buy it over the counter, they can buy it at the big box store, not knowing what they're doing because they don't know this and the client doesn't know the danger they're in because a person who is unauthorized, unlicensed, it takes, look guys, it takes to take a test to be able to do this is in Florida, it's three years of experience, six to eight hours of examination and you prepare for three months. That's how difficult it is to learn to do some of these things and we do it over and over. So understanding the science versus the marketing versus the unrealistic expectations versus the hope and pray. You have to follow the label. You have to follow the science. You have to do what is right, both for the client and help the client understand this. Okay. So if this video has been helpful to you, will you do me a favor? Subscribe to the channel right now below. Hit the subscribe button. Click the little bell. And that will let you know when you get a new video because what we're helping to do is educate everyone in the industry about this. Go ahead and subscribe. Also like it and do me a favor, comment if you can and share it with your friends. Put it on your social media, anywhere that you can post. Go ahead and share a link with this with your friends. Hey, this is Frank the Pest Geek wishing you a pestacular day.